Okay, sorry about the day. We were setting up some uh, Windows uh, environment. Uh, so this is uh, how we're gonna pre present. So hope you ca all can see this uh, screen. Okay, my topic today is building your Spark machine learning job online like Log Lego. So what does this mean? This side we call it Spark Machine Learning Workflow Visualization. So this sounds mouthful, but uh, as I explain more and more, you're gonna learn how each of the words means. Okay, before my speak, I want to uh, introduce a bit about myself and my company. Um, my name is Hu Dawei, or you can call me David, and uh, I work for Cupida as a system engineer. So Cubita is a enterprise analytics company. So we provide one-stop enterprise analytics service. Um, it's based on open source. And all this Hadoop, Hive, Spark, we, all the mainstream technology, we've been using them. And also it's uh, data source and platform agnostics so that you can basically connect any source of uh, data, then output it to anywhere, yeah. And these are the, our main features, so we connect your data to the Hadoop to leverage the power of a Hadoop. Uh, so that from there, we start to discover your data, transform it, and uh, figure out the uh, valuable information out of it. Then at the end, you can, uh, we output the analyzed report so that you can have this uh, nice intu intuitive um, web interface to know what your really what the data really is about. All right, this is uh, the intro. So let's jump into the topic here. Spark machine learning workflow visualization. So what does it mean? So it's basically you can create and modify and. Uh, execute a Spark job with just a single drag and drop uh, feature through a website, and all happens immediately. So I will give you a quick demo first, then you know how it looks, and uh, I will explain the details and uh, uh, the technology we've been using to support such a, a model. Okay. So I will show you the, our cluster. So as you can see here, this is a workflow. So you can see it's all been linked, connected together with uh, this um, direct async graph. And all the run from the reading a data frame to eventually apply different machine learning algorithm and uh, get your result, get what you want. And uh, this one I have already run it, so you can ch um, change it like this so that all these uh, parameters you can change. And also for those things, and the you can even see the preview of a intermediate data set so that you, after each step, you will know what happens to your data and uh, does your uh, purpose to build the workflow is correct or not. All right. This is going to take a while because it's running actual Spark job. So uh, I will go back to the slice. So this is a structure, how the structure looks like. As, as you can see, read the, we read the data frame first, then filter some column by input some uh, conditions. Uh, the conditions meaning um, uh, you can just put a SQL script. So Spark transformation, which accept a raw um, Spark, uh, sorry, SQL uh, SQL script and all the this all the way down are having this um, spark um, we wrap all this spark API 
um, into this uh, nice uh, intuitive uh, interface. Okay. Okay. So here we have a couple of examples of how you can customize your notes. Take this one for example, which is a SQL transformation. So it requires two parameters. One is it's called data frame al alias. So in here you input one. So this one will create a time view in the Spark cluster. So this one, the following, the second parameter will be able to reference this one. So from here, so that uh, Spark will know how this data frame being connected. Okay. And here's another example, the split. The slipped is to a, so that um, we have a data frame, you can slip into different uh, two set of parts that uh, based on those uh, parameters say you, s you want to be random or ratio or seed. Okay. Okay, the result preview, as I introduced before, it is for Sorry, it is for the intermediate result, and of course, also you can show the final results. Uh, maybe I can show you uh, about this part. You can see here we have many, all the nodes are coming from here. Those are called categories, so that you can combine different uh, kind of uh, nodes from different categories to do what you want. So that uh, if you know about Spark, you know that uh, when you go deep, you're gonna start to write your code and using other API. So here is that you can just uh, drag and drop and uh, without running a single line of code. Okay, how does it work? So, as you see previously, the, this structure, when you run it, it immediately run. And uh, as, even though it's running from the web, it does actually launch in the actual Spark job on the backend on the cluster. And secondly, each of the nodes is being parsed into a export Scala code snippet on the fly so that each node represents a part of the Scala code. So once you change the parameters, and the Scala code is going to be changed. And the thirdly, the code is sent to cluster by HTTP POST request. So now you might be wondering how this is possible, right? Yeah. So here is if you understand the, how Spark works, you will have this naturally, you would have this uh, uh, doubts that uh, this thing is, might not be impossible. Because why? Currently there are two ways to, for you to run a Spark job. One is through the Spark shell, another one is from a Spark submit. So a Spark shell allows you to um, open a shell, so in there you start to write your code, Scala or Python or R, right? So I believe, I don't know how many of you have been using Spark. Raise your hands. Okay, uh, not so many. <laughs> I guess I need to uh, do a little introduce about the Spark. So Spark is a computing engine that uh, based on the Hadoop. The Hadoop is a distributed uh, file system, so where you store your data from um, from different servers. It's uh, different from the uh, like uh, regional. What, what's the word again? So like uh, Oracle or Postgres. So those are structured data, but normally the, your data is not so uh, structured as per se, like uh, CSV or JSON or even image, some kind of stuff. So, and they are not that important, but there are values out of it, but they are not that important. So you don't want 
uh, store them in a database that's so expensive and uh, so um, strict. So the file system is a natural place for you to place those stuff. So HTTPS Hadoop is based on this idea. So now we come to Spark. Spark is a computing engine on Hadoop, so which means that which means that um, it can gathering all the data, read the data from Hadoop, and doing all the transformation and uh, filtering and other stuff. So that uh, just like how you would do to a uh, database, the table, the data in the database, and. Uh, Okay, that's the basic uh, background about uh, Hadoop and Spark. So now, two ways to run Spark job. One is Spark Shell, and one, another one is Spark Summit. So Spark Summit is that you need to write a Spark, uh, a Spark application first, I mean, a truly complete um, Scala app, and you need to pack it to be a jar. Then you submit with the Spark jar, the Spark submit. So Spark will do all the um, like uh, uploading and uh, figure out the dependencies and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now here comes the limitation that. All those two things requires you to program it manually. It makes sense, right? So if you want to go just run a, to using Spark to analyze some data, you need to get your uh, code first and go to Spark shell to piece there or just manual typing, or you build it as an app and submit, sub, submit from the, to the cluster. And this way, the second one part is gonna be, it's gonna require the cluster access. So which is actually quite limiting because not all the people are administrator. So you can, and they are not familiar with the uh, server environment or something like that. So this actually very um, limiting the power, powerless of the Spark so that and so it makes you think that is there a third way, alternative way to that get a full use of the Spark and, but also make the access to it it's being easy and uh, accessible from anywhere. Now you might be thinking the third way. The naturally, if you've been a developer, you know most of the request communication by the HTTP request, right? So here, if only we could just use the good old HTTP request that is easy to use, so standard, standard for heavy devices, you can uh, using your phone, your browser, or whatever, tablets, and it's easy to access, so it, you can use any kind of uh, tools like her, um, even a software like Postman, and it's lightweighted. Whenever you want to make a pull request, you don't really need to add any dependency to it. So because most of the language and tools are already having this uh, supporting the networking, right? So this is the good things about HTTP requests, the web. So, if you think about it, though, so is there, what if we can combine Spark and the, with the um, web interface? And that's what uh, Livy does. So introducing Livy. Livy is a, a Apache project uh, which is uh, still ongoing, but it has already really nice uh, rich feature that you, you can use. So it is, it's a web service that enable easy interaction with a Spark cluster over a REST interface. What does this mean? This means that by the API provided by the Livy, you can 
submit, you can use different ways to submit your Spark job to the cluster. One is to pre-compile jars that which you already have that All good? All right. Okay. Okay, where are we? So we, we introduced this uh, snippet code, and thirdly, the Java Scala client API that where you can write your um, Scala job in, embedded within the app and uh, using the API to um, submit it. And uh, all this stuff you can find on their website. It's very uh, detailed and very uh, well organized. So you can read about it later uh, if you are interested. The second feature is that the Levy is ensure security. Well, the secure authentication communication so that you don't need to worry about the, your data being uh, linked because that it's sending through the internet and it's easy to integrate with a lot of authentication libraries on the Hadoop like uh, Ranger, something like that. You can figure or you can customize with your own service. And thirdly, the most important one um, is sending most of the APIs as uh, asynchronous request. What does this mean? That this means that once you issue a, a HTTP request to the cluster, it won't wait till it would it would return the response immediately with a body to indicate the current status of the cluster. So it will not wait your job your job to be finished and it's gonna give you a response. So if you think about it, it's quite reasonable, right? Most of the most of the jobs are actually um, running from minutes to hours, which is very um, time consuming. So this one, uh, by doing this, you can immediately get the re um, response and do figure out what's the next step to do based on the response. All right. And here is the Levy infrastructure. As you can see, here is the HTTP interface. And here is a client which you need to uh, embed it, uh, integrate it with your application. And sitting between the client and the cluster manager, which can be mostly is Yarn. And we have a REST server. So whenever a request comes in, and the request server is going to sign this code or jar directly into the cluster, cluster manager and starting the new job. And it's going to keep getting the latest response, uh, sorry, keep getting the latest uh, status from the cluster that you can uh, using, how, that's how you get the information out of it. So now, now we know the infrastructure of the Levy. Um, how do we implement, how do we integrate with our uh, current design, which is a machine learning workflow, right? What, you, what we did, what we, if you want to uh, integrate with Levy, what you need is to enable the Levy service in the QB, sorry, in your cluster. Um, what you need to do is to download in the Levy and set it up, and once you set it up, uh, you will have in a uh, Levy URL and ports, where you can communicate with Levy. Um, after that, you can send the code snippet to Levy request 
leave a REST server by the post request. And as we talked before, it's uh, asynchronous, so we will do the post status for the latest executing session or the statement. Okay. Now the next step, we let's check about the, how the API looks like. It's actually quite simple. There are a lot of APIs, but those two are the most important ones that if you want to um, use in Libby. First one is to create a session. It's very simple that you post slash sessions um, to the Libby endpoint and pass in the a body with a kind parameter. And by default, it will be Spark. If you want to use Spark, you can um, ignore this one. But if you say, I want to start a session in Python or R, then you need specifically this to be py spark or spark r. All right. Now, once you post it, it would immediately give you a response. In the body, it will have an ID of the session. So here, you can use in the second, second API. This one, if you call this, it will give you the status of the current running uh, session. So at the beginning, if I create a session, it will be busy starting. Once it's been created, it's gonna show you it's been created. Now you can do the following things. Okay, the second one, which uh, our platform is uh, highly uh, relied on, which is, uh, is uh, creating a statement. Similar like this, um, it has to post a statement and it it only, in the body, it only require code and you pass in the code you want to run, right? It's plain simple, it's just a string. A string that represents a Scala code. Or if you prefer um, Python, you can write Python code. But I'm uh, familiar, I'm good at with Scala, so I just choose Scala. So now, similar like the first one, if you post, you would have in it will return a state statement ID. So you can get uh, using the same RESTful API to get the statement of the last sending code. Yeah. So giving those information that how the Libby works and how our workflow works, then you might have a clue that how those things being combined together. So let's review this whole picture here. So this workflow is combined with different type of nodes, right? You can think of the node to be a com configuration that eventually gonna be created, a, eventually gonna create a piece of uh, Scala code snippet, but how? from a visualized node to the actual Scala um, code. And uh, here is um, here is uh, if we review the, one, the previous one, we can figure out the relationship between um, uh, all the structures. And from there, we can start to design our data structure. So, as you can see earlier, it workflow, it consists of a sort of a sorted node sequence and metadata. And metadata is about like a description, the ID or name that you, just for the, the other information, you don't really care about, if they, don't, they don't really matter if you run the Scala. The node has a certain input and output with different types. So go back to here, you can see, let's take a filter column as an example. It has an input, it doesn't say, but uh, the input is a data frame. So we use different colors to indicate different type, type of data frame. So data frame is a, you can think of a abstracted table, like, uh, loading into memory that 
gather the data coming from Hadoop. So you can think the, uh, the data frame is the main abstraction of how um, Spark would uh, uh, transformation and actions. All right. So it accept an input. So an input from reading data frame, and it outputs two things. It out one is the also a data frame that I want a sub data frame. I do some filtering, then I output the result. Makes sense, right? And it's also outputting a transformer. What is a transformer? It's a reusable structure that uh, you can apply to the other data frame. So let's say this uh, configuration, uh, this uh, filter column is so powerful, so useful, I want to reuse everywhere. But I don't want to create a node for in all over the place. I don't want to duplicate that. So that if you don't want to do that, now you can connect it to a different data frame, then do a transform like this one. So that you can, that's, that's the way how you can reuse it. OK, enough about the details. And this is a workflow, and it's, they are the nodes and with its nodes. Sorry, sorry, one more thing. We are talking about two types of uh, output here, data, data frame and transformer. But uh, you know, for machine learning, you also have um, train model, or like the feed one, the feed one, once you feed its data set, it out, um, produce a model, or some other the, like this one is a metric, which is just a single value that uh, indicate how um, how good your model is. All right. The child nodes need to know the parent node output type and the positions. What does this mean? Uh, go back to the example here. You can see the split. It also accepts the data frame from here and it split, uh, split the data frame into two. Right? Now we have a node that produces two data frames. So that, let's say, a child node, so that not only, not only need to know the parent node's type, which is data frame, but also need to know the position of that so that they don't get confused. So, so if by this one, you know that I need a ID is this, and the type is data frame, and output ID is two. Let's say it's two because one, two here, right? That in this way you can um, identify the exact parents of the child of is. Okay. Each node needs a code generator. What does this mean? As you can see earlier, each code has a ton of. Uh, I mean, not ton of, but uh, um, how do you put this? Because based on the purpose of each node, that they do all sort of things, right? Do do transformation, do um, machine learning, and uh, do apply different kind of algorithm, and also you want output the data into a different uh, places like Hive or HDFS or S3. So all serve different purpose. So naturally they would require different parameters right so how do we com combine the code and parameters together to to generate a valid Scala code and here is our data structure design Um, before I introduce anyone here is uh, know about Scala? Okay, not so many. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, okay, I think it's still okay to indicate how it works. Um, a case class is a uh, how to put this is kind of a class that only contains data. You can think of it that way. So a data structure, a struct like a C or whatever other things is. If you know about Java, don't have this, 
um, but Kotlin has a data class that was whatever you know what it is, right? So case class, we have a workflow. It ID, name, and uh, list of nodes. So you can see the type here is Victor. Victor in Scala is a immutable array. You can think of that. It's immutable so that once it's been created, you can never change it. And uh, the list of a node, and each of the nodes having this, this structure. So you have order ID, which indicate which one first or which one and which one the second. It has a name and category so that um, you can see one more thing here. So, so you can see we have different categories and having different names. So the output, so is a output would be the category and the name would be the actual node name. But in this way, we, we can uh, um, we can locate a, a node that precisely in our code. Okay, here, code generator design. Um, in our case, we call it statement, similar like the, the one you see in the Levy API, create statement, right? But in this way, um, ignore the name, you can think of a builder that taking a node as a um, parameter, then output a piece of um, string, which is valid Scala code. And you can see, uh, because we have all different nodes, right? Um, so we want to have a common interface to ensure that all the um, nodes having the similar behavior, say that they all need to be having a, this snippet interface that as long as this node uh, implement this statement, they have to implement this, implement this snippet so that um, it will give out a um, code string. And here we have parallel output types, self output types, and prime keys, and a snippet. Those three things, are, the first three things are actually like serve as a validation role because we need to Read the, uh, read the data from the database and convert it into the previous one. Sorry. Into a, this kind of structure so that in the statement in the builder, we want to validate are the data is valid or not. Why? Because that when we click, uh, when we collect all the configurations into the, into the DB, we've been using MongoDB, we cannot really guarantee that if the data input by the user are valid or not. So we do a double check here. So the last one is a uh, one that matters, that, and this one produce the actual code. All right. Before you saw the structure, so yeah. So why are your output types vectors of strings, not vectors of either types or, or spark types? Does you mean the output? Why the? So why your your types uh, your types are all vectors of strings? You mean here? Actually, that's a very good catch. Um, right, before, right before I do this uh, uh, presentation, I do this uh, uh, snapshot, I notice that string is a bit um, flexible. Is that, what you're, is that what you're concerning? Yeah, so um, type, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. So a better refactoring can be uh, we use object. That object is quite 
like a class about a sing singleton class, and it's very um, it's ty it's type guaranteed. So we can rely on the strong type system in Scala, not by this uh, string. String is too flexible. Even though we do check if it is comparing to a is this a data frame or other stuff, but yeah. That's a very good uh, catch. Thank you. Here. Another question. Because I have soft class and on a trading. So here. Best design, but you need to instantiate different statement. Because different statement will be, you will have a class with a huge uh, statement for different kinds of things. It's better have a trade class that is seen. <coughs> so you implement the statement everyone inside the same uh, class file and you prevent the problem when you try to do a lot of uh, matching because you can use the standard match and reduce the Okay, problem. I see. So your question is how do we based on the kind, based on the type, category and the name, how do we figure out which builder to use? Is that your question? Or you are For the statement class, why is not ready? Why is not, sorry? Uh, the statement class that we write can be converted to a trade via the node, uh, node node. I'm sorry, I'm not quite getting the question here. Abstract class it should be C trade. If you do a C trade, it's better. Uh, uh, also in order the other code, because you, you must. You mean the Y is abstract or? Why is not ready? Okay. Uh, Why are we using a type safe approach to do these kinds of uh, the statement? You are using the statement. Yes. The base for providing uh, the the code that will be sent to the to the other. Uh, okay. The so the most important part for you is to have that the statement is much more possible type safe. One type problem safe. was the key parameter. You can use, uh, for example, enumerato that can give you the, yeah. uh, a better approach for, uh, for uh, yeah. mm, is right. using a seller trade statement. So you will define all uh, the statement inside the same uh, Scala file. Okay, actually, I am only showing part of the statement part. I also have a company object, but uh, the screen is too small. I think that's not irrelevant. Um, maybe I finish this thing, and actually I'm not quite sure what your question is. So maybe I finish mine, and uh, you can, uh, we can discuss more about how this de uh, design approach. Okay, so here is the abstract class statement, which is a builder, so that for different kind of nodes, you can, you will have different kind of builder to inherit this one. And uh, in terms of, okay, let me show you the code first. So, previously you see the code structure. Now you are wondering, once I get reading a node from the database, how do I convert it, how do I find the right code generator or builder, right? One way to do that is because we have in this um, name and category, you can, one way to do that is to you have a big match case case and this list gonna keep continue growing uh, as long as you have more nodes being added into you. or by something else. Here you can see we are using a reflect, uh, reflection which is a Java concept that you dynamically find in the class when during the runtime. So how do we do that? So we having, you can see here, we, based on the category and name, we find the, this, this defines a class path for that builder. And here we have this concrete statement. Now the following would be, um, find that statement and uh, the class, the con constructor, and eventually I create a new instance of that, of that uh, statement. Okay, you can see here, 
I pass this, this which itself is a node, right? And you can also check out, uh, if you remember, the abstract class statement accept the node. So in the node, I pass myself into the statement I just found out based on the information, uh, name, and category we found out. Now we having a statement instance. And uh, statement in instance would call a snippet and it <coughs> immediately return as a code snippet. Make sense? All right. Okay, here, maybe our, this is a example of how this um, code generating from uh, raw data from database into a, um, a real code, a uh, valid Scala code. Here you can see here, I have a node, which is a no node number three, uh, order ID as three, you can see. And it have category trans transformation custom and we're gonna convert this underscore into a dot so, well, so that match the Java mechanism, okay? Um, no name and description, you can ignore it. And object, JSON object. Output, which is a array. So this means that this node cell uh, um, SQL transformation would output a data frame, as you can see here, which itself is a string. The parent outputs, because one node can have one or more or no parents, so that is also a list of objects. So the object structure is ID, parent ID, which is uh, order ID of the parents, actually. And uh, output ID, Output ID indicating the order of of the parent output, like the one. Remember the example I told you. The these two same kind, same type of the of the data frame. So you need to figure out which one is the correct one. So that output type is data frame. So this is a raw data stuff in the Mongo. We've been using Mongo because it's uh, quite convenient to do this kind of stuff. Here is a SQL transformation just for that node. Okay, as you can see here, we have all those three because inherit the statement. Now we need to override those um, uh, method to make them to make this uh, node work. The cool thing about Scala is that when you define a method in the abstract um, class or a treat, in the, par in the subclass, you can actually re not using the method, but using val. So that save you, save you uh, from a repeating computation that whenever I need this, I don't need to recompute it, but directly um, uh, compute it once and cache it. Next time, I directly get the value. All right, so here's a snippet, uh, the most important one that here. This is a template. So based on all those uh, parameters, I have got this parent data frame and the self data frame output and uh, produce a code that, which is valid Scala code. Okay, so to answer your question, the stream part, right? The, here you can, yes? Of course. Why did you reinvent this batch? Why don't we just use functions? Sorry? Uh, type. I mean, what you predict here essentially yes. Yeah. Is, uh, function. Uh, 
Uh, okay. So yes, Scala has a. You can define the define function as type. That that's your yeah. Of course. Okay. That's the reason I design like this because in Scala you can go really um, deep and using all these nice features. But for me, I think this is the most understandable way to to imp to implement this one. I think it's forget about this uh, this is Scala code. But even if it's, uh, you are a Java developer or a some or Python or Ruby. I think this you can implement this same idea into other places. I think not because you can define a function in Scala as a type, you should I don't think you can you should use that to just prove just or just showing how good this code is. But I think for me the the readability is the most important thing. Yeah. So that's my approach. That's why I choose this approach over that one. Yeah. Okay. So here is uh, all of this a bit technical. So if you have questions, we can discuss uh, later. So a simple one. A previous one is quite complex, and uh, the the output of the final Scala application can goes to hundreds of codes. So I create a small one. That what it does is quite simple. Read the data frame, do some transformation, and write into a Hive table. Right now, the write data frame by default goes to Hive table. So here is the output of the Scala code. So as you can see, if I paste all of this code directly into the Spark shell, it would run perfectly because you can the um, the Levy maintain this thing is you can think of like a Scala shell online version of Scala shell Spark shell sorry online version of of Spark shell so you can see the name I defined so this is the first node second node and third node by giving a standard format of the variable I can reference the parent um, nodes easily. So the, all, the, all the data frame outputs having the same structures like start with output and with the order ID, the indicate the nodes, and the type, and the output. So in the second one, as long as I know the parent's uh, type and ID and uh, and position, I would immediately calculate how this can, how the parent node can be found, right? So here, I have been read the data, data frame, select all from these transactions, uh, and I want to find all the city um, city A, and I write it into city A transactions. That's that's simple. Okay. This project is not uh, not all, all not all the ideas are coming from us. So this one, the C, there was a open source project called Seahorse, which does similar things like what we did, but uh, we've been being in parallel, so we don't know each other. But uh, once we found out, we uh, we are very um, how do you say excited, and uh, we go to their website and check out uh, their repo. And uh, the same things, what they did is actually go really, really deep that together with the JVM and the Hadoop platform and uh, um, they redefined a lot of things. But for us, and you can, if you go to the project, it's actually lasting like almost two years and hundreds of manpower to developing these things. For us, I, I, we want, I want the same feature, and uh, by, discuss, uh, by studying the Levy, I figured out we can do it in a way, um, simpler ways, which is we manually hard coding every uh, template of the operation so that um, we can 
put them together as you want. So if you want to know how uh, the full picture, you can go here and check it out. We add this, what we did is similar, but uh, way uh, easier. It only cost like three months. Uh, the backend is all on me, so yeah, the design and the backend implementation, um, that took about two months. So comparing one month, two months to a full two years, I think that's uh, quite uh, uh, efficient way by using DV. Yeah. Okay. Takeaways. What do we learn? What do we learn from this uh, project? First one, of course, the very impressive one is Levy. I think it's really opened a lot of possibilities to uh, how you build a Scala job. So it really unleash the power from previously you can only need oh you can only log into the server and and write your code and submit it and in this we leave it is much more flexible and uh, more have more access second one during our implementation because we need to wrap wrap every like most of the operations using spark apis so we found out most of your needs are actually it's already been considered in the Spark API. So, so I think it, the most impressive thing is that they really started well and really perform it. The performance is so good that I think every time you want to implement something you own, you want to do some data, think, think it twice to see if Spark has it already. Go there, documentation list, and have a check. If not, I'm, I mean, 99 of a chance you already have something there. And third, thirdly, the immutable data structures, which is not a um, common concept outside of Scala world or outside of functional programming world, um, but it's, but it's very um, important that you know this because once you force yourself into a um, think of the data as immutable transformation instead of getting a data I want to modify it then you can see your whole um, idea about programming can change that's why you can see here in, in the code I showed you I only use the immutable actions like Victor um, map or set those kind of structures that once you create you can never change and all my code are using var instead of var and uh, i think that is uh, uh i think that really guarantees that uh, in the generated scala code having um very few bugs uh, because that you know the second layer of the scala you can see here This one is actually quite small. Some of the nodes can be close to hundreds of uh, uh, lines. Take, for, uh, take one for example, uh, we have a node called uh, handle missing values. Um, it's a common operation that if you um, do in statics, that which is that, if you have some rows that are having no values and you want to do something about it, you can replace with a custom value, or you can replace with the mode of the column or the medium of the column, you know, that kind of thing. So for each different strategy, you need to calculate uh, that value to fill. And that is take a lot of uh, effort to build that. This is a quite simple one, because, uh, but this uh, serves the demo purpose. All right. Here are all the reference I was talking, uh, I mentioned earlier, the Levy Apache project, the DeepSense AI and Seahorse, and the, our previous talk by our CEO, Preton. If you interest, you can go to it. All right, that's all, thank you. Okay, any questions?
Which part? This one. Okay, this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, okay, here are lots of methods. That's um, the statement. Those are the APIs. Those are the uh, methods that each of the child. Builder need to be implemented, but there are a lot of helpers, and this um, instance method need to. Um, maybe I can show you uh, right now. Okay. Here is a Yeah, so Yeah. So the primary key is just a list of strings which is a guarantee that I need a two parameters keys one is a time value and expression and by doing and here we have a map get and this in the get you are adding something to recognize different Yes. Yes. So, yeah. This get is uh, accepting a string and using this string to find that uh, value from the database. So this get is actually a method defined in the statement. Um, Here are some uh, Scala code I'm not sure you can follow, but uh, I will try to explain. So this get accepts a string and goes to the format and get value. That's simple. Return the stuff. OK. Uh, sorry. <laughs> OK. Yeah, on your picture, you have a graph of operations. Yes. And it looks like they uh, that's a illusion. It looks like you can, some of them know that uh, have no relation, so you think you can actually, but we actually having an order defined with each other, so in reality, it's still a linear processing, each of the node. And you define it manually? Uh, actually, that part, we having two separate uh, uh, APIs. We have this, uh, this one is a, uh, backend service for all defining the order and collecting the configuration. We have in another Node.js app to do all that stuff. So the write the configuration database and the read from it is actually separated by two different apps. That's all. That's the structure we have. So you. So the the order is being defined by the front end. I'm not sure if you have some, some logic on front end or the logic or by user input. The user input. User must put some numbers in each. No, no, board. no need. Uh, we have been this algorithm to calculate which node should be go first. Yeah. So every time you add in a new node or remove one, so this new order will be regenerated every time, so that you always get the correct one. Yes. Uh -huh. Can you short something? Short. Like pipeline, like a microprocessor. Instead of going one by one, because you have the code generator, you can easily just generate a bigger. Piece of code. Yes. So right now it's uh, one. You don't should, should care because we generate the Scala code. The Scala code always sends to Spark. Yeah, but I. You interpret it in a graph. And, and this 
step in the, in the graph are aggregated by, uh, by Spark directly. So if you have some modif easy modifications, such as fields that are mark, uh, they are executing the same uh, yes, steps inside Spark. So it is, uh, it's not um, required. Is that I, I think each of those boxes, each node, is a separate Spark No, he generates a single one. Yes, so as you can see. Yeah. 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 How do you capture the errors in the intermediate value? Uh, actually, yes. So that feature is provided already by Levy. So whenever you make this uh, guest status uh, request in the response body, you can, by checking some certain uh, keys, say status, log, error message. So if say the log says fails, you already know it's something wrong, right? So you go the, to the log. It having actually a pretty nice um, structure, the log information, you can go there, check. But it's only in polling, you can't get notified. Only in polling? Like the only way you know what the error occurs is uh, Yes, but also since it's just an uh, endpoint with a UI and a, and a port that, so you don't need to use your code to go to make the get response. You can just use the any tools to get a result. Or even using the browser or some uh, HTTP client, like Curl or Postman, whatever, you can get a log, yeah. All right, any more questions? Okay, then that's it. All right, thank you.